So the Minister for Health and Social Care is with us, uh, Laurie Hooper, who's on a very tight time scale, so we've got to get straight on with this. Yes. Um, I really more, again, I just the same of how we're doing. I mean, elective surgery, let's talk about that one. Is that coming back soon now? Yeah, so I think the health service is starting to turn a corner, if I'm honest, as we're coming out of the, not out of COVID, but you know what I mean, we're coming through the other side of, of the worst of it, I think, in terms of the, the health space. So. Uh, Banks of Care have put together what they call a restoration and recovery case, which is about how you get things back on track in terms of electives. So clearing some of the waiting lists down, like the endoscopy waiting list, that's hopefully going to be cleared by the end of the month. Uh, they're talking about uh, having done some of the pre-operative assessments for uh, some of the cataract procedures. So I think there's a waiting list of, uh, of about 1,300 people on that, and about 350 of these assessments are going to be done. We're going to start pushing people through that process, hopefully very soon. Uh, so from April, I think Banks of Care are talking about actually having their electives basically back up and running to where they should be. Uh, and that's actually so is really the backlog news. is going to be there forever. Not ever, but it's, the it's backlog is going to be a challenge. Uh, and I think if how you look, big is it? Do you have to, uh, well, I, I don't have the numbers no, exactly, no, but, no, it, but, but you've seen some of the data we've released yeah, in Tim. Well, you yeah. know, these waiting lists are not small. They can take a while uh, to get seen, and even that's the averages are, are very big. But Manx Care are, are committed actually to tackling some of these, and as part of the mandate work that we've done in the department, we've been very clear that we are expecting Manx Care to uh, move from where they are now to end up by the end of this administration, really on that 18-week referral to treatment. That's kind of the aim the big picture target that we're going for and what that means is Manx Care are going to have to really work hard to tackle some of these backlogs and you've seen that already they've already announced what they're doing with the uh, ophthalmology and the cataracts there'll be announcements coming in the near future around things like orthopedics uh, there's lots of work going on with UK partners how do you bring doctors over here how do you send patients across it's a, it's a really big piece of work around actually how do we get those waiting lists down from where they are now to something in the very short term that is more reasonable and then in the longer term that is actually acceptable and of course we should talk about the overspend you know You'd be on the back benches, you'd be screaming that one, wouldn't you? I mean, now you're well, seeing this, it all happen. This, this is, this is Was interesting. it before your time? No, so in 2017, 2018, I voted against the budget because at that time I was quite open. I said the health service was £7 million pounds underfunded. Uh, it turns out I was right. Every year since then, the health service has needed to come back for more money. And it's normally, 10 this year, Well, again, we, we're looking at the overspend is probably going to be around seven. Huh? Uh, but the way the Timwood works is you can't go and spend more money than Timwood has approved. So we have, to, we have to ask for a bit more just in case. But actually, that money won't be used unless it's needed. But you've asked Banks Care at the same time to make how many millions of pounds worth of savings? Yes, saving? so this year it was, I think it was just under two million. In the next yeah. mandate year it's going to be just over four million. Yeah. That is pretty normal practice for the NHS, any NHS trust in the UK. It's no reason why Manx Care, Manx Care can't do the same and importantly that's been put together with Manx Care. So with, this isn't us imposing it on them. Manx Care are absolutely committed and they think they can achieve those savings. But with the new era of Manx Care, which costs how much they run again? Because we've had this yes, figure. Yeah, yeah. How, many, how many millions? I think it's three I think. So you know, they've got to save three, but they, they cost three or something. I mean, but doesn't it's, it all sound a bit weird to some but people? So, but it's each year. So this yeah. year they had a few million to save. Next year they'll have a few million to save. The year after they'll have a few million. Yeah. And that's the way the cost improvement programme works, is it's continuous. Would it's you vote for Manx Care? This idea of being it's separated from you, but you're still in charge. I think I did vote for the Manx Care you separation. Did. Yeah. I was Do you think it is the right solution? I think so. I think in if you look at the problems we've had in the past, and I still get this from, from political members asking me to intervene in individual cases, and that's just not right. Clini uh, clinical decisions should be made by clinicians. And that's, I think, where the health service needs to be, with medical decisions being made by the people that know what they're doing, and the strategy and policy being decided at the higher level by politicians, by elected members. So it's my job, I think, to provide that assurance around Manx Care to make sure they are doing the the things that we uh, as politicians uh, on behalf of our constituents are expecting them to do. Mm. How they do that, really I'm not a doctor, I've never run a hospital, I'm the wrong person to ask, but actually Max Care, they know the answers to those questions and that's why it is the right thing I think to separate them. Yeah. A key part of the, of the process that we've never really had on the island before is that independent inspection as well. So the CQC will be coming over, I think they've already been over a few times to start the initial process, to start benchmarking us, to start inspecting us against those mm -hmm. those UK standards. And you've had some good news about uh, training or something. Yes, that? yeah. Was, Again, Manx that Care, that's, that's top actually, top of the 170 trusts that the participate top. in that. Mm -hmm. That's really good news. I think it shows a lot of confidence in the training we do on Ireland mm -hmm. and I think it does really build the the case that uh, me and Max Care have been talking about quite a bit actually around well actually how do we increase the amount of training on Ireland if we are a centre of excellence if we are doing this so well surely that is a very good reason for increasing the amount of training we're doing to try and uh, improve the, the training offer to Manx students and say so how do we train our own rather than constantly having to import people so it's a really good news story but I think it does then lead on to well how do we build on this and make sure that we are offering the kind of training and, and support that people really do need on the island. With all this extra money going in though you need more people uh, that's where the money will go will it to more doctors more 
uh, areas. I mean, there's no and private wards. So, I mean, not that I'm a private person, but you know, yeah, it so seems the, weird that we haven't got it for those who want to pay. So, the private ward, I think, Mounts Care have been mandated again to get that back up and running this yeah. year. The way that we'll be doing that will be slightly different. So, uh, originally it was run by the health department. The idea now is maybe to, can we bring somebody in to run it? Because ultimately, what we don't want to do is impact on our waiting list yeah. by taking doctors and staff away from what yeah. they're doing day to day. Uh, will all the money go to additional staff? Uh, in part, it will, but in part, it's more about what's the right thing for the patient. So, it could be around different equipment, different procedures, different uh, different tools, yeah. and you'll see Max Care uh, actually this week announce they are going to start changing the home barrel screening. Again, some of it is around technology and around the use of equipment and resources rather than just hiring more people. How is the morale doing? Because that always seems to come up, and it's it's an issue. And you must have you been, oh, you got the hospital yet to walk around and do that I've stuff. I've been or? up a few times, uh, and the offer is always there for anyone if they want me to come to the department. Just pick up the telephone. More oh, than happy to turn up. I, I don't randomly turn up because obviously they're quite busy people. Um, but no, I have a lot of contact with uh, with medical staff, uh, and I think it's fair to say morale. we are we are turning a corner. I think COVID has been difficult. It has. There's no two ways about that, and it continues to be difficult. You know, we talk about moving to an endemic phase, and I think from a public health perspective, that means a lot of sense but what that means to the health service is things will change but they will still be under pressure in terms of treating patients that have covid treating patients that don't have covid but need to share a space it's going to continue to impact on us for a long time to finish with uh, i don't think i'm going to get an answer have you but i just have to ask there's a tribunal going on which is you know the, the british medical association taking on dhsc um You've been, you gave evidence in the end, did you give something? Um, I, I, I did. your so involvement? You haven't seen that, you down there in the, in no, the, that was the stalls that's watching the extent, it? No, that was So it's uh, very much a staffing matter. I, oh. I can't comment on it because it is an ongoing judicial process, semi-judicial process, being a tribunal. Um, but no, I did give evidence. I was called to. Uh, I gave uh, an affidavit. I required to do that by the tribunal. So I did my, my part. And really, I'm now following it just like everyone else is, largely through the media, because it is something that is one step removed, I think, from, from the political You'll space. You'll end up on your desk at some point for action to be taken, I'm guessing, or through something. Uh, uh, quite possibly. I, I, yeah. I don't know the answer to that. Well, we're must. not there, are we yet? So we are slightly ahead of the gun. But it's, it's something that will be talked about, no doubt, once this is settled. I yeah, uh, undoubtedly, it's gonna, it's gonna, there will be a decision made at some point, and yeah. someone will have to respond to that. It could very well be me. Um, but ultimately, like I say, it's very much a staffing matter. It's very much an ongoing process. I can't really talk about the detail, mainly, because, like I say, I'm not involved with it quite deliberately. So. <laughs>